Now, the single most interesting thing about last week for me is that the ICC prosecutor has gone in silence on genocide. He has only gone on war crimes and crimes against humanity. Hello and welcome to Independent Thinking, the weekly podcast from Chatham House. That was Barrister Philippe Sands. I'm Bronwyn Maddox. This week, we're looking closely at that ruling by the International Court of Justice telling Israel to halt its military offensive and any other action in the Rafah governorate, and also the move by the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court to apply for arrest warrants against the leaders of Hamas and the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, as well as his defense minister. The two decisions have come as international criticism of Israel's war against Hamas has grown as the humanitarian crisis in Gaza has worsened. So we'll look at what these decisions mean, the differences between the two courts, what might happen next. We'll look at the ramifications and whether these rulings will help or hinder a resolution of the conflict. And we're also going to consider what this means for international law, much of it created in the hope that law would be an alternative to war. Are we in an age when it is thriving or in retreat? I have a brilliant panel of experts to discuss all this. Philippe Sands is a barrister specializing in international law and a professor of the public understanding of law at University College London. He's acting for Palestine in separate proceedings in the International Court of Justice about Palestinians' right of self-determination. So I should say that he's speaking to us in a personal capacity. Welcome to the podcast. Hello, very lovely to be with you. Also with us is Lawrence Hill Cawthorn, an associate professor in law at the University of Bristol, who has, as part of his extensive work in this field, advised United Nations Special Rapporteurs. Welcome, Lawrence. Hi, thanks for having me. And finally with us is Nomi bar Yakov, an Associate Fellow of our International Security Programme and an international negotiator in the Middle East. Welcome. Thank you very much, Bronwyn, for having me. Delighted to be here. Delighted to have you all. Let's first discuss what has actually happened in the last few days on the ICJ and RAFA and the ICC prosecutor's decision. But before we go into some of that, let's just spell out, for the sake of our listeners and, and the whole discussion, the differences between the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court. Lawrence, I wonder if I could start with you and if you could explain those to us. Sure. So, so the International Criminal Court is a court based in The Hague in the Netherlands that has jurisdiction over individuals for specific crimes under international law, particularly war crimes crimes against humanity, genocide, and in, in some circumstances, the crime of aggression or the crime of waging an illegal war. The International Court of Justice, also based in The Hague in the Netherlands, it is quite different uh, in that it is an interstate court. It's a court that deals with the responsibility of states for violations of international law rather than the criminal responsibility of individuals. And in this particular case, the case brought by South Africa, against Israel at the end of December, the court is focusing on the really specific question of Israel's responsibility for genocide in Gaza. We'll come on to that point, the significance of that charge and this particular case. But look, just a tiny bit more on the history, because they have very different histories, don't they? The ICJ was founded in 1945, its first sitting, I think, the, the year after, as the main judicial body of the UN, really trying to adjudicate disputes between states. And the ICC is much more recent, isn't it? Just over 20 years old, founded after these special ad hoc criminal courts that we got used to in the Balkan Wars, and is the first permanent court of its kind, and some would say still trying to establish its reputation. The ICC is, is obviously a much more recent innovation. In fact, the International Court of Justice's history goes back even further than that, as, as it was a, a kind of renewed effort under the UN to return to an interstate tribunal that, that pre-existed it in the form of the Permanent Court of International Justice under the League of Nations. So the International Criminal Court is, is much newer, quite different in that respect, uh, but it does have that important context of those ad hoc tribunals set up in the 1990s in relation to the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda that really set the scene and, and endorsed that idea first really recognized at Nuremberg and Tokyo after the Second World War, 
that crimes are, are committed by individuals, and so individuals themselves should be held responsible in addition to the state for which they act. So, Philippe, you spent your career in international law. Would you say we're in an age when it's thriving? We heard about this new court being created a couple of decades ago, or is it in retreat, being contested on all sides by countries and individuals who say, well, we don't much fancy that applying to us? Well, I think you have to put the whole project in context. I mean, it's a very young project. It was essentially created in 1945, and it's a long game. Um, you know, when I was a young research fellow at university, I had a colleague, Sir John Baker, professor of English legal history, and he'd asked me what I was working on, and I'd say uh, whatever it was. And he would say, ah, yes, Philippe, we, uh, we used to work on that in English law in 1372, and it took 270 years to sort it out. So basically, we've created a world order in 1945. It's not going to be implemented anytime soon in a full sense. It's a work in progress. One of the things that is interesting is as political institutions are increasingly manifestly unable to deliver, there is a turn to courts and tribunals to fill the gap. That imposes really tough burdens on judges, the ICJ judges, for example, having to deal with South Africa's case against Israel, and also the difficult issue of for the prosecutor and the judges at the International Criminal Court of timings. Let's not forget that the Nuremberg proceedings, on which much of which is happening is based, occurred after the war was over. And there is an issue about starting proceedings whilst conflicts are underway. That's a really tough thing for judges. I'd just like to add that one of the problems is with the uh, new courts, like the uh, ICC, is that not every state is a member of it. Whereas with the ICJ coming at the end of World War II, there was a consensus that this is the most uh, serious court and the creme de la creme you know, of international law judges were sitting on the court. And I think there was a general view, a general acceptance worldwide that whatever the verdict was, it was accepted. Whereas with uh, newer courts like the International Criminal Court, states like the United States, for example, have not ratified the Statute of Rome, the Rome Statute, which is the founding statute of the court. And Israel doesn't recognize the jurisdiction of the court either. So you have new problems with newer courts that you did not have when you just had a single court. I'm going to come back to these points right at the end, but it's absolutely central to what Chatham House is doing on the new era of global governance and who gets to have a say in it and, and indeed what part international law plays in all that. So let's dive into the detail. I mean, there is quite a bit of it on what is happening in both courts. It's, it's quite a lot. Let's start with the ICJ. Lawrence, what's the specific action that it has demanded of Israel? Yeah, so, so the order of, of last week in relation to uh, South Africa's case against Israel was a, a mechanism many international courts and tribunals have where they can issue provisional measures orders, where essentially they order the parties to do or refrain from doing particular things in order to protect the rights that are at issue in the case. And this is because these kinds of cases take many years to, to come to fruition to lead to a final judgment on the merits if we reach that stage. So provisional measures orders are very early proceedings that allow this. Last week, the, the court really ordered Israel to do three things. First, it ordered Israel to immediately halt the current RAFA offensive in Gaza. There's some disagreement about the precise wording of that aspect of the order, but I, I think that the consequences are fairly limited depending on which of those, those interpretations you take. The second aspect of the order required Israel to open and maintain open the RAFA crossing for the delivery of essential aid to the Palestinians based there. And the third order required Israel to ensure access for UN mandated investigators uh, who, who will be looking into and preserving evidence in relation to genocide allegations. Just a second, though, on that f the f interpretation of that first bit, because there has been a lot of controversy about it, telling Israel to halt its military offensive and any other action in the Rafa governorate. And then there are various uh, kind of qualifications of that, which may inflict on the Palestinian group in Gaza conditions of life that could bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. Why is there controversy about what this means? Does it mean to Israel, stop 
doing what you're doing in Rafa or not, as others argue. So I think it does mean to Israel that it must stop doing in Rafa what it is currently doing. So, so the, the two interpretations are essentially either a, a more limited version, which says that the court ordered Israel to stop the military offensive in Rafah insofar as it poses a risk of genocide to Palestinians there. The broader interpretation is one that says, well, actually, the court just ordered an absolute end to the offensive in Rafah. In my view, it, it, it's sort of irrelevant which of those interpretations we take, because the court was very clear earlier in its order that the nature of the current offensive is such that there is a, a further risk of irreparable prejudice to the rights of Palestinians as a consequence of the current offensive in Rafah. And so the conclusion, the only conclusion we can really reach from that first provisional measure is that the current offensive in Rafah has to stop. By irreparable prejudice to their rights, you mean things like them being killed and their houses being destroyed in a way that cannot be repaired? Absolutely. And, uh, but also the, the fact that Israel had provided insufficient evidence to show that the huge movement of Palestinians from Rafa to Al Mawasi just was not accompanied with any, any serious attempt to ensure the safety of the population there, that the facilities simply weren't there to admit 800,000 individuals in early May. Philippe, I wonder if you could set out for us how this fits in with the charge that South Africa has, has brought against Israel overall and this this question of, of genocide? Well, I mean, I'm just going to uh, speak in abstractions because, as you mentioned, that I'm, I'm involved as counsel in another case, and so I'm just going to be quite careful and restrained. Uh, I want to say this, though, about what the International Court of Justice judges are faced with. I really do feel for them. They only have jurisdiction on genocide. They don't have jurisdiction on war crimes and crimes against humanity, or on the use of force. So they're in a very tough position. Uh, and they've learned from their experience over 20 years, and I've been involved in many of the cases of the court, that the real risk that they face is they get a lot of egg on their face if they do nothing. But if they go too far, they get criticized. So they're damned if they do, and they're damned if they don't. And that's why they're coming up with orders that are ambiguous. In exactly what they mean. For your listeners, it's really important to understand that the ICJ doesn't have jurisdiction of these types of cases for war crimes and crimes against humanity. In my view, war crimes is undoubtedly taking place uh, in Gaza and probably also crimes against humanity. The reason genocide is more difficult to argue is because of the court's jurisprudence. In the Bosnia case, in the Croatia case, and they've set a very high threshold. And that's a problem for bringing these types of cases, not just South Africa's case, but for all cases. And the reality is that South Africa, for its own reasons, wanting to get to court, has to shoehorn its arguments into a genocide narrative, simply to get into court. And the judges, I, I think, are very anxious about what they do in this case. And that's what everyone who's closely watching is picking up from the judges. Now, the single most interesting thing about last week for me is that the ICC prosecutor has gone in silence on genocide. He has only gone on war crimes and crimes against humanity. We'll come on to the substance of what he's done. Very frankly, the two courts look over at each other's shoulders. And I think the judges at the International Court of Justice will undoubtedly be taking note of the fact that the ICC prosecutor has not alleged genocide, either in relation to the attacks on the 7th of October or what has happened in Gaza subsequently. So I think it's a case of watch this space about what happens. But the main thing not to forget, and I've been on the receiving end of judgments at the ICJ, it is fantastically hard to prove genocide because of this need to prove a special intent to destroy a group in whole or in part. And what the court is very nervous about is that they want to distinguish between armed conflicts, wars, where nasty and terrible things happen, and they do not want to open the door to every war that happens in the future, then 
leading to a genocide case being brought to the International Court of Justice. And that's the dilemma for the judges. Those are really important points. Nomi, you're speaking to us from Jerusalem, I think, and you've been talking extensively to Israel's government as well as to many others in the region. Just take us into Israel's response to this and the particular fury that this charge of genocide has provoked. I think it's. I think the Israelis are feeling that the International Court of Justice is micromanaging the conflict as opposed to dealing with the judicial um, issues. There have been four requests by South Africa and as to for a ceasefire. And as Philippe stated, the judges of the International Court of Justice are undoubtedly feeling the pressure, and they only have jurisdiction over genocide. And genocide in Israel obviously has a very important and worrying uh, context because of the genocide that occurred in the Holocaust. So Israel's rage is saying, look, we, are being, we, we, we have been, as a people, the victims of this on an extraordinary scale, and now we are being accused of this as we go to defend ourselves. Correct. But like Philippe said, I mean, the fact that the Karim Khan, the prosecutor of the International uh, Criminal Court, did not pursue charges on genocide is extremely significant. And I think everyone following these cases took note of that. And he did state that investigations are ongoing, but he chose to issue the requests for arrest warrants at that specific time. And he chose not to wait for those investigations to end. So I think it is um, extremely significant. So let's go on to the International Criminal Court, which is tugging inevitably at this conversation. And Nomi, do you want to just take us into the action that the ICC prosecutor has taken so far against Hamas and Israel's leaders? You could spell it out. So the uh, International Criminal Court prosecutor, Karim Khan, has requested the pre-trial chamber to uh, examine whether uh, arrest warrants can be issued for three members of Hamas and two members of the Israeli government. For Hamas, it's Yahya Sinwar, the leader of Hamas in Gaza, who is principally responsible for planning and orchestrating the massacres and slaughter of the 7th of October 2023. Mohammed Daif, who is the head of the Azadin al qassam the military wing of Hamas, and Ismail Haniya, who is the head of the Hamas's political bureau, who is based in Doha. The other two are based in Gaza. We believe they're in Gaza, I should say, after previous uh, podcasts discussing whether or not they are there. Coming on to what the, the, the counts are, um, extermination, murder, taking hostages, rape and other sexual violence as crimes against humanity, torture, other inhumane acts and outrages upon personal dignity as a war crime and a systematic attack against the civilian population. Those are the charges against the Hamas, three members, and the evidence he states is CCTV footage, audio uh, recordings, photos and uh, statements of experts. For Israel, he has decided to try to get arrest, to seek arrest warrants for Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Defence Minister Yoav Gallant. Four, starvation as a method of warfare, willfully causing great suffering, willful killing internationally directing attacks against the civilian population as a war crime, extermination, prosecution, and other inhumane acts. Now, interestingly, he states in both contexts that he views the conflict between Israel and Palestine, he views Palestine as a state, and between Israel and the non-state armed group, Hamas. And this begs the question, of how and why he views Hamas as a non-state actor within a state of Palestine, given that Hamas won the democratic elections in Palestine in 2006, and they have been sitting with the Fatah uh, party in a national unity government on and off and still holding discussions more recently in Moscow and in Beijing about the future of the state. Lawrence, what happens next? The prosecutor has asked for these arrest warrants and, there are, and now a process unfolds. 
Yeah, so so it, it will go to a pretrial chamber of, of three judges who, who will decide on on the request for an arrest warrant, and they base that decision on on a standard of reasonable grounds to believe that the crimes alleged were, were committed. And an arrest warrant will only be issued if it's necessary either to ensure the appearance of the defendants before the court, to prevent an obstruction of, of justice or, or witnesses, um, or to stop ongoing crimes from being committed. Because the court can only uh, judge people in, in person. Exactly. And what is the implication of this? Uh, the, these arrest warrants? can't see that it is going to inconvenience Hamas leaders very much, conceivably, Hanaya, uh, who does move around a bit. But it could be quite, a, if, if upheld, quite an inconvenience to Netanyahu and Gallant, couldn't it? Yeah, so, so if an arrest warrant is issued as a consequence of this, then all member states to the Rome Statute are obligated to, to carry that out and transfer the defendants to the court uh, should they appear in their state. So if Netanyahu then travelled to the UK, for example, as a party to the Rome Statute, the UK would be obligated then to transfer Netanyahu uh, to the court. Of course, we've seen with previous arrest warrants, al-Bashir um, of Sudan being the most obvious uh, states parties refusing to honour that. Al-Bashir famously has travelled around since being indicted by, by the court many years ago, and states in the, that situation have not arrested him and transferred him to the court. So there's a huge problem with compliance, but that obligation does rest with all states parties to the Rome Statute. And what does that problem with compliance mean for the standing of the court? As you said, this is a youngish court, which has had a very mixed record of success in trying to bring people to trial. Sure. I mean, I think the context of, for example, the al-Bashir arrest warrant needs to be borne in mind, right? So, so a lot of the problems there was that many states, African states, were concerned that the court was unduly focusing on conflicts within Africa and not focusing on conflicts elsewhere, particularly those involving either Western states or allies of Western states. So that was the context for a number of states like South Africa, Jordan, to not implement that arrest warrant in relation to al-Bashir. Here, it's different, of course. Here, like the, the arrest warrant issued against Vladimir Putin, for example, we're talking about sitting head of state of a major power, and, and in this particular case, a major power with considerable Western allies. So there, you know, we, we may see a, a greater willingness to enforce that arrest warrant should it should it come about. But it remains to be seen which particular states would be willing to enforce that. And I rather suspect Netanyahu and Gallant would, would base their travel plans on precisely that issue as to which states are willing to enforce the arrest warrant and which aren't. Philippe, is this a battle for the credibility of the court or not as dramatic as that? But it, it, I, I'd love your views on this this record, this 20-something year record of patchy success. I mean, I think the, the prosecutor uh, you know, has got himself into a very difficult situation and it's partly of his own making. He decided to issue an arrest warrant for Vladimir Putin. There is a question as to the wisdom of having done that publicly. There are some who believe, and I'm amongst those, that it was done essentially to head off the creation of a special criminal tribunal for the crime of aggression. Not for reasons of principle, but turf. The prosecutor doesn't want another tribunal created, although that is in progress right now. And so he publicly issued an arrest warrant, requested one in the pretrial chamber, gave its authorization, as I think it's likely it will in this case in relation to the five requests. And having now indicted Vladimir Putin, along comes this conflict, and he's got a bit of a problem, because the crimes that are being committed, frankly, on both sides, are at least as grave as what is happening in Ukraine. And so he can't do nothing. Equally, he can't just indict one side, so to speak. He's got, he'll be trashed if he just goes against Hamas. He'll be trashed if he goes just against Israel. So he's got himself into a bind where he's had to basically go for both sides to protect himself 
he's got together a panel, which is actually an extremely distinguished and excellent panel. People like Adrian Fulford and then your own Elizabeth Wilmshurst, who are... A distinguished fellow of Chatham House, yes. Yeah, I mean, extremely knowledgeable, experienced, careful, thoughtful individuals. And they, of course, would not be involved in the question of whether the prosecutor should have done this now. That was a matter for the prosecutor. But he's got substantive backing. And they're basically saying in that report, which is available on the website of the ICC, and I really urge people to read it because it's a very carefully drafted document. It's absolutely compelling. I mean, I've just, I've already said, I think, on the BBC that, you know, the, the legal arguments for making these issues be the subject of potential arrest warrants is unimpeachable. There's, there's no challenge, I think, to the, the, the basis. The real issue is should it have been done at this moment? That's a political issue. It's not a legal issue. And let me ask you about, about the question of, of doing both at the same time. Because you said, look, he did this, he had to do it in a sense. But this is one of the points that has caused, again, outrage in, in Israel and uh, indeed some of its allies, including the US, saying you are making a moral, you're drawing a moral equivalence between Hamas, who initiated these attacks of October the 7th, uh, and Israel in its response. It's an unfortunate and frankly absurd argument. Crimes are being committed. There's no question. No one is saying there is a hierarchy or they are the same kinds of issues. The prosecutor is in a very difficult position. You see a conflict taking place. Crimes are being perpetrated on both sides. What do you do? You don't issue a list saying, oh, well, there's a Division I Premier League of crime on one side, so I'm going to go for those. And I'm not going to go for the others. If you're going to do it, you've got to do both. You can't, you can't do one. You either do neither or both. And so the equivalence argument, frankly, is really unbecoming. It's unfair to the prosecutor and those uh, who are advising him. And it's also a way of distracting from the fact that there is on the ground, I mean, putting aside the horrors of what happened on the 7th of October, and they are appalling crimes that were committed, the horrors of what's happening right now in Gaza. I mean, where we are in near famine conditions on an industrial scale. That is, however one characterizes it, utterly appalling and shameful. And in the face of that, what is a prosecutor to do? He cannot not act. And the claim by the government of a sovereign state that it's somehow illegitimate because it's an equivalent is really unbecoming and is absurd. Nor me. I think that there is a, it's a question of perception. And I think one needs to appreciate that both societies, the Palestinian and the Israeli, are deeply traumatized. And I think it's very hard for each society to recognize the trauma on the other side, and there's some blindness to it. I think that there's a genuine uh, feeling that the manner in which the statement by the prosecutor was made draws some moral parallels. It's not to say that the crimes of which both sides are committed are the same, but the fact that he chose in the middle of the war to issue uh, the request for arrest warrants is complicated. It's tricky. It's not the way it used to be done where prosecutions like in Nuremberg happened after the war, you have all the evidence. I think there's also a question of evidence and what evidence is um, available. As mentioned, there's a panel of experts. The panel of experts had reviewed the evidence that was available, but there are some serious issues about the various requests, including the uh, idea of getting a fact-finding commission into a war zone while the war is uh, ongoing. Philippe, do you want to just come back on this point about Nomi's uh, suggestion? Prosecutors should have waited till the end of this conflict. You know, it's, it's, I'm not expressing a view one way or the other. I think there are other ways of doing this. I remember back in the 1990s when it came to Mrs. Milosevic and Tujman, there were no public arrest warrants. It was all done secretly and people didn't know what had been done. And you know, I really don't want to criticise the prosecutor or his team. They're, they're working in really challenging conditions. But I've always thought 
from my experience in the Yugoslav cases, that secret arrest warrants have something to say for themselves, that no one quite knows what's happened. It, it's a way of signalling things, but also, more to the point, it doesn't do what has happened both in relation to Putin and Russia and is plainly happening in relation to Israel and presumably also in relation to Hamas, which is the mere issuance of an arrest warrant tends to strengthen support in the domestic constituencies for the subject of the indictee. And, you know, just speaking to friends and colleagues on both sides, in the sense to take Nomi's point, the outrage channels into added support for actors doing outrageous things. And one has to ask, is that a socially useful thing to do? Now, just to be really clear, I'm not for a moment saying he shouldn't have done it, but I really think you need to factor into your decision-making in these things. What is the optimal moment for doing it? You don't want to strengthen the hand of the perpetrators. And, and I am worried that what this will do is cause people to dig in their heels rather than actually be persuaded to back off. Arguing against myself, the reality is the political and diplomatic efforts have come to mount. You know, the British and the Americans continue to provide support for behaviour that should not be taking place, frankly. And they've reached the end politically. And so the prosecutor presumably will have taken a view that the political and diplomatic point having come to a place where it's going nowhere, the horrors are continuing, he ought to act now. And I understand the legitimacy of that argument. Putting it in short, it, it's a really tough decision uh, to take. And each of us might ask ourselves the question, if we were he and they, what would we have done? And it's not self-evident. While we're all pondering that one, Nomi, what difference do you think it will make on the ground? First and foremost, I'd like to concur with Philippe. The request for the arrest warrants could have been done in secret, like it was in the um, Balkan cases. And I think that's a very important point. I think I agree with Philippe that uh, it, will, it could embolden both sides. It will just, it'll make negotiations tougher, uh, more difficult. And it's um, not necessarily going to be helpful right, uh, to have done this in public at this given moment in time, given that there's still... 126 hostages in Gaza, and Israel is in Rafa with horrendous consequences. We've just seen uh, over the last uh, 48 hours of an attack that caused uh, the deaths of over 50 people and massive fire that spread. These things happen in war, and the war needs to end. But I don't think that an indictment of this nature for three Hamas members and two the Prime Minister and the Defence Minister of Israel is going to help the end to end the war. And I think that is a great pity because the war must end. Lawrence, what's your take? Is it helpful? Harmful? Makes no difference. It's very hard to judge um, from the chair I'm sitting in. So so I'm also, you know, relatively agnostic on that point. But you know, we see evidence from previous investigations and convictions by the ICC on both sides. So we've seen some evidence that the ICC can have a deterrent effect on the ground. Of course, it's a difficult thing to prove, but in Democratic Republic of Congo, in Colombia, the opening of investigations arguably has affected things on the ground, either at the level of government policy in Colombia or at the level even of the conduct of hostilities by rebel factions in the DRC. But that's quite different from indicting a sitting head of state in the midst of an armed conflict that is reaching, as Philippe said, the, the sort of the clear end of any potential political resolution. And, and it, it's pretty clear that we could equally see an entrenching of Netanyahu's position, for example, and equally that of the, the Hamas leadership, particularly when his own status domestically in Israel is, is also under threat. Uh, and so it's certainly not clear that this will contribute to a resolution of the conflict. But again, it's a huge issue. And, and, and you know, I, I'm certainly not qualified to make any determination in that respect. And as Philippe said, there's 
there's clear evidence that politically there's been zero achievement on the ground. I'm really interested that you and Philippe are very much agreed that the political process has stalled. And we've obviously got the US as a player in that uh, coming in uh, repeatedly, though not unequivocally, on, on Israel's side. Philippe, you really feel that the political process has run its course? No, of course it hasn't run its course, but right now it's, I mean, of course it will, it will pick up again. And there has to be at the end a political and diplomatic solution. There will not be a military solution and there will not be a legal solution. But this point of the conversation, I think, ties into the broader themes that your listeners are probably interested in, which is what does this tell us about the state of the world? And I think something interesting is really happening here. And I think this is the continuation really of what began 20 years ago with Iraq and Afghanistan and Russia and Ukraine. And what one is seeing very, very clearly is the writ of the West is diminished, significantly diminished. And the ability to impose solutions has gone. And more significantly, and I think worryingly, the allegations of double standards are rampant around the world. You know, Russia attacks electricity infrastructure in Ukraine and gets condemned by the British and the Americans. Israel switches off all the electricity for the whole of Gaza and Britain and the United States pass in silence. I mean, no one has a monopoly on double standards. I mean, on the one hand, you know, South Africa launches a case against Israel. On the other hand, it's welcoming Mr. Lavrov uh, to a visit in Russia. Russia, which is basically bombing civilians across Ukraine, all of a sudden discovers the need to protect civilians in Gaza. So, I mean, there's a sort of rampant double standard across the spectrum and across the board. But for the West, this is particularly significant because the order, coming back to your very first question, that was put in place in 1945, was essentially an order that was put in place by an Anglo-American alliance with some French input and with some Soviet input. But, but essentially, that was the design of it. And it's now being taken over by the South Africans of the world, by other countries that are beginning to if you like, use it against its own founders and creators. And the founders and creators now on the receiving end are feeling, whoa, what's going on here? So I think what we're going to look back on and see is that this 20-year period is a point of real change in terms of power politics around the world. And th thank you for anticipating exactly where I wanted to take this conversation, which is one of the main themes, in fact, the main theme we are dealing with at Chatham House. But what, in your view, is the implication of the US uh, not only perhaps declining in the, in the world, but rejecting uh, and standing up against some of these cases brought by the, uh, South Africa? Well, I mean, it's sort of, you know, hilarious, except that you want to weep. On the one hand, the US Senate passes a resolution by 100 votes to zero, which doesn't happen very often, offering support to the International Criminal Court for its efforts to indict, prosecute any Russian who walks, just about. <laughs> Notwithstanding the fact that Russia is not a part of the statute of the International Criminal Court. And then along comes the Israel Palestine conflict. And oh my word, Israel's not a party to it. We have to defend Israel outrageous that the ICC. You can't get away with that. You just can't get away with that kind of naked, blatant double standard. The US has is is, got itself into a terrible mess. And you feel that actually, you know, we're not going to get too involved in domestic politics, but I've just been teaching in the States. And you see in the domestic political debate and the coming presidential elections, you know, the Biden, Trump, how this is just causing it the most immense grief for President Biden and, and may well be a reason he struggles to get re-elected. The irony of the protests is that they play right into the hands of Mr. Trump, who, of course, will adopt a position on these conflicts, which appears to support both Mr. Putin and to support Israel to the point that he is mightily going to alienate 
large, if not all, of the Arab world and much of the rest of the world and probably the whole of the global south. So there's sort of a wake-up call moment. Who are we? What are our values? What do we care about? And this needs to be brought to an end. And it can only be brought to an end successfully then with some sort of principled approach and not the kind of approach that is being adopted now. And just to say, I mean, I feel as strongly about the UK, which has just been all over the place on these issues and is in a complete mess. And the next British government has got to take this issue by the scruff of the neck and adopt a principled stance across the range of these conflicts. I'm interested by the suggestion by Gideon Rackman and the FT this week that perhaps the US should give up on trying to say it's on the side of international rules because it isn't following them and instead say it's on the side of the free world. That's another debate. Nomi, do you agree with Philippe that the US is in a a muddle over this and is jeopardizing its standing by its equivocation? Yes, I think the US is in a mess and I agree with him fully that this uh, could feed into the hands of Donald Trump. And I think it's the same in Israel. It's not just that it emboldens Netanyahu, it emboldens his supporters and the right. And we're heading, hopefully, towards elections in Israel and in Palestine very, very soon as a post-war. Then we'll need to be elections held. And whereas a few months ago, I was certain that there would be a center government or center left government. And this week, a new uh, leader of a very promising new leader of the Labour Party in Israel was elected, who is going to unite all the left wing parties. But a decision, uh, both the ICJ and the ICC, without a shadow of doubt, feeds into the right and right of the right, including the fanatics. And that's very worrying. But I think, yes, um, both the UK and the US, terrible mess. Lawrence, your final thoughts on the the state of the rules-based order and and the significance of these cases we've been discussing for it. Yeah, I I mean, I I concur completely, as I think is is kind of inevitable. And in the UK's case as well, uh, as Philippe hinted at, there's been a total lack of any principled approach. And that's because these issues are being treated as part of a political game, right? Lives of Palestinians are, are being treated as political pawns. And that's outrageous. And it's outrageous not only morally, but also legally, because the US, the UK, and all other states have specific obligations that apply in relation to Gaza, for example. They have obligations to ensure respect for international humanitarian law. They have obligations not to be complicit in violations of international law. These are legal obligations binding on those states, which those states have consistently failed to adhere to. And so it's not only a moral imperative, but a legal one as well. Where we go from here remains to be seen. I think what was particularly interesting about the ICJ's order of of last week was that it's by far the most specific order so far that the court has given in relation to South Africa's application. It's given three orders, January, March, and last week. Uh, The January order was pretty vague, all quite abstract in its references. And the orders since then have become more and more specific. And they've become more and more specific because the risks to the Palestinian population that were recognized in January have started to materialize as these proceedings have gone on over the last five months. Those risks of famine and starvation, for example, or the risks of an offensive in Rafa, all of these risks have started to materialize. And so the court's orders have become more and more specific in relation to what Israel has to do in Gaza. On that note, we are going to have to bring it to an end, uh, this discussion that is. Um, But this does, as I very much wanted when we started putting this program together, it does very much focus on the the big themes of the standing of international law and whether it is going to thrive in the future or whether it is going to be systematically challenged. So a big thank you to my guests, Philippe Sands, Lawrence Hill Cawthorne and Nomi Bar-Yakov. Do follow them on Twitter or X or LinkedIn. Their details are in the show notes. Our international law program has published an explainer on the ICC prosecutors' applications for the arrest warrants. Please do go to chathamhouse.org to read that, where you'll also find their paper about enhancing the security of civilians in conflict, timely given what we're discussing. A reminder that you can find all episodes of Independent Thinking on all major podcast platforms, as well as through our social media. So please do like, follow and subscribe. And after another busy week at home and abroad, 
goodbye from me, Bromer Maddox. See you next week.